Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Stewart. I'm the director of the Swanee Writers Conference, and I am really delighted to have these two writers here to read to us tonight. They happen to have written two of my favorite books, Margot Livesey, author of Eva Moves the Furniture, and Sarah Swanian Bynum, author of the Ms. Hempel Chronicles. Or actually, there's no the on it, is there, Sarah? It's just Ms. Hempel Chronicles. I always want to add the the. Sorry. Um, and so I'm really excited to have them here tonight to read from their new books. Sarah is going to read first, and then Margot will read, and then Gwen will moderate a Q&A. Uh, you can either raise your hand to ask a question or put a question in the chat once we get to that point. Um, uh, sorry, I think there was something else I was going to say, but now I just forgot it. Oh, I, it was just a silly thing, which was um, that Sarah would have been at the conference for the first time this summer had we had we had it. And what you don't know, Sarah, is that we always raffle off books at the live readings of the conference. And if the name is drawn and the person isn't there, they get booed <laughs> for not having come to the reading. And if they're there and they win the book, they get applauded. So we're, we're keeping that tradition up with a little bit less of the, the audience response than we, than, than we normally have in those situations. Okay, so I'm gonna read a brief um, introduction of Sarah. Sarah is the author of two novels, Ms. Hempel Chronicles, which I mentioned, a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award, and Madeline is Sleeping, a finalist for the National Book Award, and a new story collection, Likes, right here. Her fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, Plowshares, Ten House, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and The Best American Short Stories. Thank you for being here, Sarah. Leah, thank you so much for hosting us. Um, and I am very excited to be reading with Margot tonight. And the passage that I'm going to read is actually inspired by her book, The Boy in the Field, because one of the things that she does so beautifully in this book is capture the consciousnesses of her three teenage siblings. Um, so I am also going to be reading um, from a, a young adolescent. Uh, these are uh, friends who, who are about the same age as, as Duncan, who's the youngest of the Lang siblings and, and a character that I just felt such tenderness for. Um, so I'm going to be reading from a story called Many a Little Makes. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of jumping right in. There's a frame narrative uh, that establishes the adult perspective. Um, but I'm going to just jump in and begin with, with the girls and with the friendship uh, when they're back in sixth grade. In the sixth grade, on the subject of Brie, Mari's mother had this to say, three can get complicated. She was talking about the dynamics of female friendship, a topic that Mari did not relish discussing. In general, she found her mother's warnings reliably wrong, but also impossible to forget, like shampoo slogans or camp songs. When one Friday afternoon in November, she discovered herself lodged between Imogen and Brie in the backseat of a car heading to the mall, this earworm wriggled to the surface and she thought at her mother, ha, they were fine. A thin stream of air flowed over them and the radio played a song they knew most of the words to. Brie was saying that they should buy their tickets before they got food in case the movie sold out. And Imogen was saying that a dog waiting at the corner to cross looked a lot like a larger, fluffier version of her dog, Hamish. They all craned their heads to look at the dog. Mari could jump in at any moment with a funny or pointless comment if it occurred to her, but if it didn't, she didn't have to say anything at all. Imogen had befriended Mari at the beginning of the second grade, when Mari was the only new girl in the class. Years passed and then Brie arrived, along with an assortment of other sixth grade girls. 
Out of all of them, Imogen chose Brie for reasons not obvious to Mari. Brie wore eyeglasses with tinted plastic arms that swooped downward in a secretarial way. She had short brown hair and the long waistless torso of a dachshund. On the first day of school, she appeared in a teal sweatshirt violently spattered with paint, a top that Mrs. Schmidt said was jazzy. It looked store-bought, not homemade, like something she had saved up for. Bree took the trolley to school from a town called Revere with the help of a student transportation pass that hung from a lanyard around her neck which she removed every morning and tucked carefully in her book bag as she entered the building. In the locker room, Mari had overheard some girls pronouncing Revere as Revia in order to amuse one another. And this was how she learned that Revere was an undesirable place inhabited by people who couldn't tell how thick their accents were. But Brie didn't say it that way. She spoke quickly and correctly and without any accent at all, participating in class with palpable happiness, no matter what the subject was. She was bright, Mari saw early on, which was probably what made her interesting to Imogen. Any girl at their school had to be smart or at least well organized, but not many of them, not even a few of them, had an air of intensity. To be clear, Brie wasn't excessively studious or preoccupied with cerebral pursuits, and Imogen and Mari weren't either. They didn't read Russian novels or follow current events or dismantle electronics to figure out how they work. Together, they circled the mall and talked about their teachers and occasionally stopped to go inside a store and touch things that they wanted to buy. They ate swirled frozen yogurt and then watched a blockbuster movie full of French kissings and shootouts. But if, for instance, the sight of a botanical rendering of lavender wrapped around a bar of soap should suddenly fill Mari with a rich, heady Eleanor of Aquitaine feeling. And if later she went home and pulled off the cookbook shelf an illustrated guide to medieval herbs from which she painstakingly copied out on little sheets of paper, the properties and uses of yarrow, chamomile, mugwort and whorehound, and then dipped the sheets of paper in tea and dried them outside so as to make them look more like parchment, neither Imogen nor Brie would wonder at it. Not that they would ever do the same. They weren't excited by herbs. It's just that they would recognize wordlessly the impulse to do so. That's what the three of them had in common. Otherwise, Mari and Brie were short and Imogen was tall. Imogen and Brie were white and Mari was Japanese. Brie lived in Revere and Imogen and Mari did not. Their differences were evenly distributed, yet when Mari glimpsed a reflection of them gliding past a department store's plate glass window, she saw with perfect clarity that Imogen belonged to another species altogether, like a wood elf among dwarves or a human escorting hobbits. Her hair shone in the muted light pouring through the atrium. Her shoulders were pulled back and her neck was long. When she laughed, she opened her mouth wide, and you could see practically every one of her straight, gleaming teeth. She didn't have a single cavity. But sometimes her breath up close could smell a little bit sour, a detail you'd have to be her best friend to know, because to the rest of the world, she was just a radiant creature passing by, laughing, her head floating well above the other two. Mari hadn't had a new friend in so long that she had almost forgotten what it was like to go to someone's house for the first time. The inevitable shock to the senses. The smell, most of all, not unpleasant, but unfamiliar. The school year was nearly finished when Brie invited them over, and it turned out that she lived on the right side of a gray and clabbered house that had an identical left side where a different family lived. 
a flight of concrete stairs rose from the sidewalk and at its top was a shallow concrete porch. And there stood two front doors, exactly symmetrical, even down to their storm door handles, which meant that one door opened up to the left and the other one to the right. Squashed behind the storm door on the left was a scarecrow holding a sign that said, welcome in autumn colors. We don't talk to them anymore, Bree whispered as she extracted her lanyard, which in addition to her trolley pass, held her house keys. Long story. She, I'm sorry, I'm having a, uh, sorry for the canine interruption. Um, she opened the door and out leaped the smell of her house, indefinable but strong, a little reminiscent of chicken noodle soup in a can. Soon enough, it went away. Bree had cable TV, tropical fish, and a toilet lid covered in burgundy carpeting. The three of them bargained over which channel they would watch, and somehow it felt easier to be flexible and magnanimous when more than one other party was involved in the negotiations. As they were eating cereal and watching music videos, Bree's mother appeared, holding Bree's younger sister, Bevan, by the hand. And although Bree's mother looked about the right age for Bevan, who was four, she didn't look like she belonged to Bree, despite having a lot of the same soft, unformed features. With her ponytail and scuffed up sneakers, she looked more like a big sister, like the eldest in a family of sisters fending for themselves after their parents died in a tragic car accident. Or maybe Mari's and Imogen's parents were simply old. Mari couldn't recall seeing any of them wearing tennis shoes while not playing tennis. Make yourself at home, girls, Bree's mother said to them with strange formality and ushered Bevan upstairs for a bath. Darkness fell and Bree suggested baking a cake. She made it sound like the idea had only just occurred to her, but in the kitchen she pulled out the bowl and the hand mixer and the measuring cups and the cake mix from a single cabinet, all ready to go, and Mari suddenly filled with so much tenderness that her eyes watered. The mix was Duncan Hines, and the flavor was, mysteriously, yellow. At Mari's house, what passed for cake was a nearly flavorless sponge that her mother bought at the Japanese bakery and then urged guests to try, assuring them that it was very light and not too sweet. When Brie dumped the yellow mix into the bowl, it sent up a mushroom cloud of synthetic sugariness that caused Mari to choke. Imogen perched on the counter and sliced a plastic spatula through the air as if felling enemies. She didn't try to contribute anything. She looked on good naturedly as Mari and Bree followed the box's directions. And when the cake pans, trembling with batter, were slid into the oven, she held out her arms to receive the empty mixing bowl. Oh, nice, she said. You left a lot on the sides. Without hesitating, she sank the spatula into the bowl, circled it around, lifted it back up, and inserted its entire drippy width into her mouth. It came out clean. Share, Bree said. Imogen scraped the bowl again, and Mari watched the slathered spatula head disappear inside Bree's mouth. The third time Imogen dipped into the bowl, she presented the spatula to Mari. No thanks, Mari said lightly and drew back. She deliberately did not say what she wanted to say, what was foremost in her mind, what was exactly the thing her mother had spoken ominously of, salmonella, because her mother was usually wrong. Her mother, for instance, had assumed that just because Brie was eight years older than her sister, there had to be different fathers, as she put it. Something about the tactful tone she used made Mari want to strangle her. It's the same dad, Mari had announced in a clipped voice, and don't worry, him and her mom are married. And yes, she will be at home the whole time we're there. He and her mom, 
her own mother had answered, at which part Mari had covered her ears and let out a moan. Yet three large eggs had plopped glisteningly into that batter, three large raw eggs, probably teeming with bacteria. And just the sight of the yellowness slicking the spatula was making Mari feel queasy. That and the sickly sweet smell and the buzzy fluorescent lights in Bree's kitchen and all the saliva being passed around freely. By now her friends were looking at each other and smiling. They'd seen right through her airy demurral. Panther-like Imogen hopped down from the counter while Bree closed in on Mari from the other side. Just try some, Imogen murmured. You'll like it. She handed the spatula off to Bree, but held on to the bowl, dragging the length of her finger along its interior and then extracting it, coated. She slid the finger into her mouth. It's the best part, Bree said. She swam the spatula closer to Mari's face. Trust us, it's delicious. I don't want to, Mari said from under the collar of her t-shirt, which she'd pulled up over her nose. Just a little, Imogen said, just a little tiny taste. Bree stuck out her tongue and delicately pressed the spatula to its tip. See, Imogen continued, it'll be that tiny, you'll barely taste it. Mouth ajar, Bree darted her tongue in and out, in and out, very fast. Where did she learn to do that? It looked disturbing, like in a prince kind of way. A yellow droplet sat at the end of her flickering tongue. Mari twisted her head aside. You're pressuring me. Her voice was muffled beneath the t-shirt. I don't like eating batter or being pressured or throwing up all night and getting hospitalized. Who said anything about throwing up? She yanked her shirt back down and glared at them. Hello, Salmonella? Somehow it sounded less insane when her mother said it. Imogen and Bree stared at her, speechless. Then they both cackled. Salmonella, they repeated. Salmonella? Their eyes glittered. A look of silent understanding passed among the three of them. With a gasp, Mari shoved past Imogen and dove toward the TV room. They flew after her, unleashed, made swift by their socks on the linoleum. Over and around the leather sectional, they chased her, careful to avoid the glowing fish tank, no one shrieking or laughing because upstairs, Bevan was already asleep. Just their heavy breathing filled the room. And when the two of them finally pinned her to the floor, she could feel how all of their chests were heaving rapidly in unison, like they had run a mile together with matching strides. Chariots of Fire was one of her top five favorite films. Though she didn't like to run herself, the sight of British men running was very moving. Whenever they sang Jerusalem in morning meeting, she, she and Imogen and Brie would entertain themselves by surreptitiously acting out the words. They would mime the seizing of the bow and the spear and the countenance divine shining forth upon the hills. And they would attack the low note in arrows of desire with fake solemnity. But even as they joked around, Mari found the song unspeakably beautiful. That ardent phrase, bring me my chariot of fire, stirred her. When the cake batter touched her face, it was not cold as she thought it might be. It felt only thick and wet. Her eyes were closed at this point and her mouth too, of course. Nothing, not Duncan Hines or egg-borne bacteria or anything not her own would cross the threshold. Her lips were squeezed so tightly that they tingled. No one was getting in or out. She kept herself intact, impervious to the panting weight of Imogen and Brie on top of her. With satisfaction, she felt their bodies slacken, the energy dissolving. They were thwarted, and there was nothing to do now but smear batter on Mari's face. 
Even with her eyes shut, she could tell when it was Imogen doing it and when it was Bree. Like in Chariots of Fire, where the two men ran extremely fast, but for different reasons. The Scottish one, because he believed so much in God. The Jewish one, because he wanted to fit in and show that he was better than all the anti-Semites he met in college. The perfunctory swipes across her cheek. That was Imogen, having already lost interest in the whole thing. But in the precisely centered dabs on her forehead, her nose, her mouth, her chin, she felt the warmth of Brie's attention, her thoroughness and care. After they hoisted themselves off her, Mari made her way unsteadily toward the hall bathroom, eyes slitty and face sticky. And it was here that she caught a whiff of the cake baking in the oven. She had not smelled anything like it before. Initially, it reminded her of the cloying scent of Play-Doh, which she had always hated, and in fact hated so much that when she was small, she refused to touch the stuff. But as she inhaled again, she found something spreading underneath the sweetness, a smell similar to that of butter and eggs and vanilla and flour, but not quite the real thing a smell that was artificial, but also intoxicating and somehow more intoxicating for being fake. She didn't have to taste it to know ahead of time how much she was going to like this cake, how moist it would be and how warm, how its faint chemical aftertaste would make her go back for more. Wiping off her face above the sink, she, de she decided to tell her mother that from now on, the only kind of cake she wanted for her birthday was yellow cake from a box. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was lovely. That was lovely. I was noting so many lines and Gwen was actually texting me the line as you read. That was great. Okay. Um, Margo Livesey grew up in Scotland and has taught in numerous writing programs. Her work includes Eva Moves the Furniture and The Flight of Gemma Hardy and The Hidden Machinery, Essays on Writing. She teaches at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her ninth novel, The Boy in the Field, was published in August. And if you haven't looked at her um, essay collection, it's great. I actually am scanning an essay tomorrow to, uh, to send to the students in my graduate novel class. It's the one I mentioned to you, Margot, about the, the, the use of bad writing to make a first person narrator seem real and autobiographical. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. Um, and I will hand it over to Margot now. Margo's muted. Um, I, I think you're the host, Gwen. Can you unmute her? See, you are. I'm the co-host. Did that? And I've been trying to. Oh, there, there she go. goes. Do we have her now? Okay. <laughs> Well, I was just expressing gratitude to Sawani for many things, and now I'll add for unmuting me. <laughs> Thank you, Leah and Gwen, for doing this. Like Sarah, I just think it's a fantastic thing to do, especially at this time. And it's lovely to see so many familiar names in the little gallery of, of photographs. Um, and it's so wonderful, Sarah, to hear you read at last. I'm, that was just thrilling. And I'm so happy you read something from the new collection so that I can look forward to reading it for myself. Um, I particularly appreciated the tribute to Chariots of Fire, which I think maybe you were being, um, maybe you were making fun of Chariots of Fire a little bit, but it truly is one of my favorite films in a, in a shameful way. <laughs> Um, the, the boy, and I'm honored to think that it had anything to do with the boy in the field or vice versa. And um, the boy in the field opens with uh, three siblings, Matthew, Zoe and Duncan, they're aged 17, 15 and 13. 
and they're walking home from school one September afternoon when they find a boy in a field and the boy has been stabbed. They get help and they go home and that evening a detective comes and interviews each of them about what the boy, about what they found in the field. And I'm going to read three short sections, one from each of their points of view, um, that take place in the, in the following days, soon after this momentous event. And all of this is taking place in 1999 in the countryside outside Oxford, England. That afternoon, Duncan had a piano lesson and Zoe was at cross country. Matthew sat alone near the front of the bus. The temperature had fallen and the sky tumbled with the gray clouds that his father called cumulo nimbus capillatus. Soon the swallows would gather on the telegraph wires getting ready for their long flight south. Matthew got off at the stop beside the co-op. Through the plate glass window he could see Eileen and Bob on the tills ringing up customers. He waved and Bob waved back. At the first corner he turned not towards home but in the direction of his father's forge, a few streets away. The double doors facing onto the forecourt were closed, which meant no more customers were expected that day. Matthew let himself in by the side door. This afternoon, the fire was almost out. His father's apprentice had gone home and his father was standing at the workbench, sorting nails into rows of boxes. Matthew watched his hands moving back and forth. When he was younger, he found his parents' ability to concentrate bewildering. What did it mean that he disappeared so entirely from their brains? Now he envied them. Hi, Dad. Matthew, I didn't hear you come in. You'd make a good burglar. Have they caught the man? The man? His father reached for a handful of nails. Oh, you mean whoever attacked that boy? How would I know? I've been here all day working on my willow gate. He dropped three nails into three different compartments. Each landed with a different clink and glanced over at Matthew. Don't worry, he said. He won't attack anyone else. All day, thoughts about the boy and his assailant had been sliding in and out of Matthew's brain, but that the man might seek another victim had not been among them. Now his father saying he wouldn't at once raised the spectre that he would. Matthew imagined the man lying in wait in some doorway or behind a tree. His father was still talking. Zoe was the one he worried about, he said. She was impulsive, overly confident, and she could easily pass for older. You've got to keep an eye on her, he urged Matthew, especially when she doesn't want you to. Two summers ago, when they were camping in Normandy, Zoe had failed to return from buying baguettes. They had searched the campsite, the town. Just as their mother was about to call the police, Zoe had reappeared. The guide from the local museum, whom they'd befriended the day before, had been at the boulangerie. He had taken her to see a World War II bunker. It had these tiny windows for guns, she said, and a hole in the ceiling for a periscope. Promise you won't go off with a stranger again, their mother had said. Anything could have happened. Zoe had promised, but Watching her face, Matthew could tell she didn't understand the force of anything. Only in the last few months, as he and Rachel spent more and more time beneath her duvet, had he sensed that his sister too, with the help of Luke, was learning this new language. Dad, he said, she never listens to me. 
Besides, you said he wouldn't attract anyone else. So, so you said he wouldn't attack anyone else. Well, do your best, said his father. I'll be home soon. Betsy's at her class until eight. I should explain, I'm making some cuts to read this. Betsy, the mother, is studying ancient Greek. The lattice of streets between the forge and their house was so familiar that often Matthew walked the entire distance, noticing nothing. Today, he silently interrogated the houses and privet hedges, the cars and cats and rowan trees. Do you know the boy? Do you know who hurt him? And then, as he passed the plaque marking the site of the old glove maker's factory, he was thinking not about the boy, but about Claire. She had joined his class halfway through primary six, and their teacher had asked him to show her around. She was older than him, almost 11, and wanted to go to Iceland, where there were, vo where there were volcanoes and wild ponies. One day, Claire had invited him home for tea. They had played Monopoly with her little sisters. Claire was negotiating for Paul Mall when a car pulled up in the street. The next thing he knew, she was folding the Monopoly board into the box, telling her sisters to be quiet and Matthew to do his homework. What's all the fuss, he had said. Then her father came into the room. All Matthew could think was, I have to get out of here. But did he do something? His mother asked when he tried to explain. He said good evening and looked at me like I was a worm. Next day, when Claire raised her hand in class, Matthew had glimpsed a bracelet of bruises. If I were you, he had said at break, I'd run away. Where to? she said bitterly. Iceland? Besides, I can't leave my sisters behind. His mother said she would speak to the head teacher, but unless the father did something drastic, they couldn't intervene. You mean, Matthew said, he has to hurt Claire before we can stop him hurting her. He had begun walking her home every afternoon, hoping to be invited in. If only her father would hit him, they could go to the police. But she always said goodbye at the end of her street. Then, one Monday, her desk was empty. The teacher announced that Claire's family had moved to Bristol. Matthew was almost home. There was the pillar box and the cherry tree his mother watered in summer. Surely by now, he thought, Claire had taken his advice and fled. Inside the empty hall, he turned on the light, took out the detective's card and went over to the phone. A woman answered on the second ring and then Hugh Price was saying, Ma Hugh Price is the detective. The detective was saying, Matthew, did you remember something? No, he said sheepishly. Of course the detective would think he'd called with information. I was wondering if you'd caught whoever did it. Not yet, but we do have a good description. So he's out there? He's walking around? He tried and failed to conceal his indignation. There was a ticking sound, as if the workings of the detective's brain were suddenly audible. When he spoke again, he sounded tired. He may have bolted or gone to ground, but yes, chances are, He's just going about his business. After he replaced the receiver, Matthew studied the phone with its 10 numbers, which could be combined into thousands, millions of permutations. If the man had a phone, then one of those permutations would ring in his living room or hall. He pictured himself dialing and dialing and dialing. Duncan. During English, Miss Humphreys gave them 15 minutes to answer the questions she'd written on the board about the Merchant of Venice. Then she collected their notebooks and walked around at the front of the room, calling on different pupils. 
When she looked in Duncan's direction, he closed his eyes. She asked the girl in front. At the end of the lesson, she gave him a little nod and came to sit in the next desk. In a low voice, quite different from the one she'd been using to address the class, she asked if he had read the play. He had. Did you side with Shylock or Antonio? Both. Shylock was cruel. The idea of cutting a, a pound of flesh is horrible. But Antonio treated him as if he had no feelings. And then his daughter steals from him and runs away. And what about the caskets? They were just a way for Portia's father to control her and make the suitors seem stupid. It had to be the lead casket. But you only answered two of the questions. Miss Humphreys held up his open notebook. Someone had drawn a seagull in one corner of the desk. Nearby was a rudimentary cat. Duncan saw how each could be made better. Following his gaze, Miss Humphreys said, could you have drawn the answers? If I had enough time, if people didn't keep interrupting, if... How to explain that sometimes a drawing came right the first time, sometimes it took a dozen attempts and even then failed. Do you know what a self-fulfilling prophecy is? Miss Humphreys said. If you keep doing badly on tests, you start expecting to do badly and then you do even worse. You just need more time. So I'm not, he retrieved an insult from last year, a moron. He saw Miss Humphreys register the word and the context in which he must have heard it. No, she said firmly, you have a good brain, but you're going to have to learn to stand up for yourself, to explain that some things take you longer. I know you're passionate about painting, but you need words too. On the bus home, Duncan saw Zoe sitting halfway back and went to join her. He was longing to tell her about Miss Humphreys and his good brain, but she was folding and unfolding her shirt cuffs, a sure sign of fretfulness. Do you remember, she said as the bus pulled away from school, when the Sawyer's dog attacked you? How could he forget one of the worst events of his life that had led to one of the best? He and Zoe were playing in the Sawyer's garden. Their mother was having tea with Mrs. Sawyer when the back door opened and a huge dog leaped across the lawn and in a single motion seized Duncan's leg. The, play, the pain was blinding, deafening. From far away, he heard Zoe yelling. Then Mrs. Sawyer was standing over them, shouting, let go, Leo, let go. The day his stitches came out, his father had arrived home with a dachshund. He'll help you get over being afraid of dogs, he had said. And Arthur, small, wise, the color of a newly hulled chestnut with dark ears and a beautiful smile had turned out to be the perfect ambassador for dog kind. He had carefully distributed his favors among the five of them with a marked preference for Duncan. So why didn't you scream, Zoe said now, as the bus swayed around a corner. He was eating my leg, Duncan said. All I could do was try to disappear. Did you hear anything? See anyone? You mean besides you screaming and Leo growling? No, there was a kind of haze. Remember, said Zoe, that TV program about people who nearly died and saw a bright light at the end of a tunnel, someone waiting to welcome them? Do you think the boy in the field saw someone? Duncan didn't remember the program, but he did remember the boy's pale eyelids. No, he said. Perhaps, Zoe smoothed her cuffs. He was waiting for the right person to wake him up. From the way she spoke, both halting and eager, 
Duncan knew she wanted to be that person. He himself had felt no desire to wake Carol. Carol is the boy. Watching the vein pulsing in his temple, his chest rising and falling, Duncan had sensed that the boy had made his way to a place of safety. To wake him would be to hurl him back into hardship. Before he could say any of this, Moira was standing over them. Would Zoe like to go to the cinema? The autumn Leo had tried to eat his leg was also the autumn his father's mother had come to live with them. Every afternoon when Duncan got home from nursery, he would go to the sitting room to show Granny the paintings he had made that day, and she would reward him with one of her special cough sweets, a purple oval dusted in sugar. Your pictures emanate, she told him. He asked what that meant, and she said, they reach out to people, they glow. But one afternoon, her armchair was empty. Duncan had looked in the parlor, the kitchen, before he knocked at her bedroom door. As he opened it very quietly, he was doing something forbidden. He heard a strange noise. Still holding onto the doorknob, he had stood there, searching the wardrobe, the windows, the heavy curtains, the chest of drawers, until at last he had understood that it was Granny lying in bed who was making the hoarse rattling sound that filled the room. His mother had discovered him kneeling beside the bed. Later, alone in his room, he had drawn her pointed nose and sunken cheeks, her closed eyes and open mouth. Normally, he didn't care who saw his drawings. They were his and not his, but this one he hid. And Zoe. She was still going to school, still studying, joking around with Moira, doing her chores, but it was as if her hair had stopped growing. A change invisible to most other people had overtaken her. A few days after they found the boy, she was searching for a book about Florence Nightingale when she came across a poem she had written the previous spring about her grandfather. She had carried her notebook to the churchyard and sitting beneath a yew tree, summoned her memories his moustache yellow with, with nicotine, his collection of fountain pens, the poems he recited when he, they went on walks, his interest in airplanes, his dislike of his given name, Horace. She reread her first line. When we first met, I was the unsteady one. According to family lore, Horry had taught her to walk, holding her hand as she tipsily crossed the lawn. She had been working on the third stanza when a man, a stranger, came through the gate on the far side of the churchyard. What Zoe first saw was his Panama hat, then his white shirt and jeans. He was carrying a book. She had a vivid sense of the picture she made a girl sitting beneath a yew tree, writing a possibly immortal sonnet. Perhaps the man was a scholar searching the churchyard for some historical figure, or a visitor looking for his own grandfather. The hat made him look vaguely foreign. She was struggling with the lines about her grandfather returning to the battlefields of his youth, when she felt a kind of buzzing. The man was standing 30 feet away between two gravestones, his eyes fixed not on her, but on the yew tree, his arms motionless at his sides. She glanced at his face and then, he was willing it, glanced lower. Everything happened very quickly. She saw his jeans and something that was not his jeans. The man retreated behind a gravestone his shoulders hunched, fastening his fly, she guessed, and he walked swiftly, not quite running, toward the gate. 
So he tried to continue writing about her grandfather, barely 20, trapped in a, mud, in a muddy foxhole. But after a few minutes, she set aside her notebook and walked over to the gravestones. The man had left his book on top of the taller stone. A.E. Hausmann's, a Shropshire lad. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now, was one of her grandfather's favorite poems. A flasher, Moira had said when Zoe told her. He must have been thrilled finding a nubile girl in the churchyard. But what was the point, Zoe said. He showed me his willy and ran away. The point was to shock somebody, Moira said. Not somebody, Zoe had thought, me. The man had come to the churchyard to read or look for a grave, and then at the sight of her been unable to help himself, like Antony with Cleopatra, giving up an empire for a kiss. Now, looking at the poem, it ended midway through the tenth line. She thought maybe she could go back to it or write another poem about the boy lying on the grass while the birds watched over him. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. That was riveting. And both those readings just remind me of what I love so much in both of your work, which is your the precision of your details and your psychological acuity. And that was that was lovely to hear hear those together. Um, and I'm glad, Sarah, that you picked something with that that uh, adolescent interiority so that we could hear you both doing that. That was really terrific. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet now and let other people ask um, questions. And it looks like we already have one popping up in the in the chat. So I will hand it to you to, to moderate the, the Q&A, Gwen. All right, that was wonderful. Um, so for our Q&A, uh, we've got two options. Uh, you can post something in the chat, which I'm already seeing people doing, which is awesome. Uh, if you'd like to ask the question um, yourself, go ahead and use the raise your hand feature in the participants section and I'll see a little blue hand there and then I'll just call out your name. Uh, so it looks like the first uh, question we have is from Dave and it's a craft question for Sarah. Could she speak to her choice of close third person as a POV versus first person? The writing is so intimately personal. Oh, this is a question about my favorite subject <laughs> point of view, which is something that I just find endlessly fascinating. Um, and, and I'm always interested in how choice of point of view so sharply determines what kind of story you're able to tell. Um, in the case of this story, uh, the third person felt like the, the, the best fit for this um, tale of friendship because I wanted to have a little bit of um, ironic distance from Mari as the central consciousness um, of, of, the, of the story. Um, and I felt that if it were told in first person, um, it that 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 wonderful little sliver of detachment that allows us to see Mari's uh, fussiness in that, for instance, in this scene. Um, uh, you know, yes, we're experiencing the cake batter um, coercion through her eyes, but at the same time, I also wanted to have enough distance from her so that the reader can perceive um, how, how overly fastidious she's being, how uh, prissy she's being in this moment. You know, he, here her friend has invited her over for the first time, which is in some ways such an um, act of trust. And for Mari to enter into this situation, into this new home and into this new space and to have this um, very prim and fussy response to this shared experience that's supposed to be fun, uh, I felt like that was uh, 
something that close third person allowed, that we both can experience Mari's horror at watching the raw eggs go into the batter, but that we have enough distance to also see how, to what degree she's overreacting um, and how she really needs to be tackled in this moment. <laughs> um, so, so Dave, thank you for that question. Um, who else? The floor is open. Um, I guess I can I can ask a question, um, Margo. Um, I was very interested in how you used such a sort of like a strong sort of crime fiction premise to let you do so much kind of wonderful narrative, almost experimental work with so many different points of view. And so um, I'm, I'm really interested in sort of in your work, how you balance sort of really strong plot with kind of narrative innovation, if that's not too big a question, or maybe how you did it in that particular book. Um, that is a wonderful question, Gwen. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I'm really interested in, in the ways in which detective fiction has had a real flowering in the last 10, 15 years. And, Particularly, women have be, are, many women are rising stars of detective fiction. So, I find that very intriguing how women are, are politicized and feminized detective fiction. And so, I was interested in the form. At the same time, I wanted to subvert the form. So many detective stories begin with a body, and often that is the body of a beautiful woman. Um, lying somewhere and I just thought <laughs> enough of this um, I'm going to have a young man and he is not going to be fatally wounded but there will be a sense of a, of a, of a real crime having been committed and um, of the for Matthew Zoe and Duncan their um, their lives are all changed by this encounter and um, at first, I wasn't even going to have a detective. And then I thought, oh, no, 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 there has to be a detective. So I invented this almost shaman-like detective who wanders through the narrative, trying to solve the crime, but becoming a kind of mentor to Matthew, who takes on the quest of looking for the assailant. So I wanted the novel to have a the shape of a detective novel, um, it begins with a crime and the crime is in some way solved by the end of the novel. And at the same time, for most of what you're, for most of what you're asked to pay attention to, to be what's happening to Matthew, Zoe and Duncan and their responses to what, to seeing the boy in the field. And I, I really like the way the, um, disorder of violence is uh, is played out in the background as it were thank you margo uh we have two new questions in the chat uh one is for margo and then one for both of you uh so oh mark jarman asks um it says Carell and duncan appear to have the most important connection by the end of the boy in the field was that something you could see as you began the novel I did want them to both um, both be slightly, very, very slightly outsiders. I mean, Duncan is not really an outsider, but he does notice uh, he does notice that he is adopted. Um, it suddenly occurs to him, oh, I'm adopted, and my hands don't look like my parents' hands, and my skin is a different color, um, and. The boy in the field, Carol, is an immigrant from the Czech Republic. So when he comes to England at the age of nine, he has to take on a new identity, a new language, and, and refashion himself. So I did mean that there to be a sort of connection between them in, in some way through, through their identities um, and through their ways of looking at the world. Thank you. Uh, and as I said, this one is for you both. And I think a question that will definitely interest all the writers here. Um, Katie Simpson-Smith says, 
Thank you so much for the beautiful reading. As you celebrate these books entering the world at a strange time, I'm wondering if that very strangeness is preventing you from working on new material, or if you find the particular isolation of this era useful or inspiring for your creativity. Sarah, <laughs> what do you think? Well, I have a discouraging report from the front here, uh, which is that I have found it enormously hard to uh, tap into the concentration that fiction writing requires. I have really sort of um, struggled to even even read at, in, in a sustained way. Um, I just find my attention um, sort of like radically fragmented. Um, and, I, and I think also um, this ominous feeling of doom <laughs> that um, right now feel, feels particularly acute because the light here in California um, is so eerie. Everything is sort of bathed in this very forbidding orange glow. Um, and I, I'm really uh, having a hard time um, shutting all of that off in order to enter into a fictional world. Um, so, so yes, I'm sorry I have such um, <laughs> dispiriting, uh, uh, such a dispiriting response, but, but I, I, have, I have really struggled. Um, also, it's just, you know, sharing space, you know, my husband, my daughter and I were all um, now working from home. Um, so I uh, am, sort of temporarily set up in the dining room and um, it's it's very hard when I sort of uh, have the the sort of constant flow of family traffic um, plus the two dogs one of whom is 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 half a dachshund so I had a very special spot for Arthur um, so so it, 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 it has been it has been hard what about you Margo have you have you been able to write well I think I had rather somewhat the opposite reaction. I um, came back from Iowa to Cambridge for spring break and then realized I was not going back to Iowa and would be teaching on Zoom like so many others. And I just felt like, oh, my whole life is being disrupted here. And I have had periods of disruption and difficulty in my life. And from many of them, I have emerged empty handed. And I just thought, this is unbelievably annoying, um, but I can still do the things I want to do, namely reading and writing. And the worst part for me about the pandemic in a selfish way is not being able to go to Scotland. Um, so I've started writing uh, in March, I started a short novel set in Scotland as a way to go there every day. Um, and I think it may have no other virtues whatsoever than than that it's a, a form of travel. Um, but, but solace isn't nothing. And I think also I wanted to model for my wonderful Iowa students. I mean, I was urging them all to write. And so I felt like, you know, I have to try to keep them company. And also for a while I was reading Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light, which I thought might last as long as the pandemic, but <laughs> then it failed me by ending. Oh, <laughs> um, um, well, you know, we don't have any questions left. Um, that was I wanna ask, um, I wanna ask a follow up. I, I actually, I, I wanna ask, oh, okay, we have another, um, we do. We have a new question for follow up, which is this. Um, you know, I was thinking about about you just saying solace isn't nothing, Margo. And last night, I mentioned at the beginning that I, I attended a virtual fundraiser last night um, with Kamala Harris and Hillary Clinton and Maya Rudolph and Amy Poehler, and uh, the two the two com comedians were talking about. Uh, that it gives them comfort to know that they've made work that can give other people comfort in this time. And 
Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering um, how you're thinking about, because because I know that uh, I know other writers, and I know some some of my students struggle with this sense of uh, oh, the novel that I was writing about marital difficulties. Like, who cares about any of that right now? And and so I've been thinking about the role of art and the role generally, and the and and the role of what we do as writers in a time of great difficulty. And and I wondered if you had any. Um, any thoughts about that, whether that, whether that is something general or just things that you have turned to for solace your, yourself at, at this time? Well, I'm just, I'm thinking so many things at once. I'm thinking about Sarah's wonderful reading where I care passionately about eating cake batter. I mean, an hour ago, I would have said, I don't care about cake batter in any form. And yet here I am on the edge of my seat. So. Um, I do, f I mean, I do think it's a, a very confusing time. It, um, I mean, right now, I'm not trying to write about contemporary life, but usually my novels have been set close to the present and quite what that will be like when I return, um, I think is a really complicated and interesting question. Everything feels so so precarious at, at the moment. But I do persist in, in thinking that, um, that making, making art is a completely valid thing to do in many, many circumstances, um, not instead of all the other political things we want to do, but, but in addition. Um, And, and to chime in, I do feel that um, the experience of, of being a reader or the experience of, of being a listener or, is a chance to um, have a moment of communion with another mind, with another uh, spirit, even while we're physically isolated. Um, and I, I have had many, I feel like many of those moments have been all the more heightened for me because um, I have been um, physically alone, but that profound sense of understanding or uh, a joining that can happen when you read a consciousness like Duncan's or when you hear, um, a piece of music played by someone over Zoom, as you know, these these I, the the the, the um, videos of of musicians playing by themselves and yet still playing together have been um, very affecting to me, um, and it's just been similarly watching dancers um, dance, you know, isolated in their kitchens and yet on Zoom, still trying to find ways to be uh, in communion together. That, that for me has just reminded me of, of how essential art is. Um, that's a great question, Leah. Yeah, it is. Well, we've got uh, two more questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is for both of you and it says, do either of you ever have friends or family who object because they think they are at least in part recognizable in your story? And if so, how do you react to that? Um, I have been in some other people's stories, but I will say I regret that I have only been the most minor character, so <laughs> I never really get a chance to hold forth or do anything exciting. Um, in an early novel of mine called Criminals, I borrowed lavishly from a friend of mine called James. And, um, and then I did some things that I thought disguised him, like I changed his name and I did two or three other things. And um, when James read the book, he, you know, made some comment like, oh, that Owen chap, you know, I mean, he doesn't seem very organized or <laughs> I can't remember what he said something quite pejorative about his namesake. But I will say that every other person who knew James who read the novel said, 
within one sentence, Margot, that is James. How could you? So um, I have, I do try now to be better at disguising the people I'm borrowing from. I go to greater lengths, I hope, <laughs> to make sure they won't be offended. What about you, Sarah? Well, for, with my with my last book, with Miss Hempel Chronicles, um, one of the stories in that book was very much inspired by a teacher uh, who who I worked with, uh, who was the fifth grade teacher, and she was just one of these legendary, extraordinary teachers of children. Uh, and sh and when I started writing. Um, the story, I sort of promised myself that on the second or third draft, I would go back and substitute all of the identifying details. Uh, and, and as you said, Margot, disguise the, the inspiration. Um, I really thought I was going to cover my tracks. But then when I went back, so many of those details were, were inextricable from the essence of this person. I was like, I can't, I, you know, she, 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 she used to do this incredible project with the fifth graders where she would have them build the temple of Dendor inside the fifth grade classroom. And they would bring um, paper towel rolls and toilet paper rolls and cardboard boxes. And then they would construct this, astonishing edifice <laughs> and just nothing I could come up with as a fiction writer could compare with this marvelous detail uh, from her biography. Uh, so, so despite my uh, intentions of disguising this portrait, a lot of those details remained. And I was very fortunate that she received the story in the spirit that I intended it, which really was a, a, the spirit of admiration and, and, and wonder at, at, at her gifts as a teacher. Um, but it is, it is, it is such, um, it's it's difficult territory to navigate because um, also the other thing that happens with us as fiction writers is that sometimes we will borrow details from real life and then a sort of alchemical process happens where then the character takes on entirely a life of her own, um, quite separate from whatever particular details or anecdotes that gave rise to her. And yet uh, those identifiable details um, get confusing to readers who might think Owen <laughs> is, for instance, a faithful portrait of the, the particular idiosyncrasies or mannerisms or uh, biographical facts that gave rise to him. Um, so, so, so that's that's always a very delicate, a very, a, a very delicate um, issue to to navigate. All right. Well, we have one last question, and this one is for Sarah from Anton Hagen. It says many of the primary characters. Oh, okay. Um, many of the primary characters in your new collection are people of color often in ways that arguably problematize traditional humanist reading. How conscious of a choice was this? I, oh, Anton, of course, asking such a uh, thought provoking question. Um, I was very lucky to get to um, know Anton when he was an undergraduate student at UCSD and, and he, um, still stands out out of many, many wonderful students I had then as being one of the um, just most interesting minds. So, so it's really, it's, it's fun and challenging to receive that question from you, Anton. So um, 
the, the choice to, to make the primary characters um, uh, uh, people of color, I think was also just a sort of a reflection of um, the world as I experience it, um, that I really wanted the, my fictional world to um, reflect the uh, lived experience that I have, you know, both within my family, within the city of Los Angeles. Um, and that is an experience that is, that is a multiracial experience. Um, so, but in terms of, of sort of, you know, challenging um, certain prevailing narratives. I, I, I do think that inevitably um, that becomes part of the project as well, that, that um, when writing about um, characters who are black or brown, that it's, it's imperative to be conscious of the uh, conventional tropes around telling those stories and those lives um, and and to sort of try to find ways to explore those characters without falling into the quicksand of recapitulating uh, dominant narratives about people of color um, so so, I, I feel like even though that wasn't the um, impetus for writing these stories or for um, imagining these characters, inevitably that becomes part of the project uh, is, is thinking about how can I tell these stories in ways that don't simply end up reinscribing um, harmful narratives. Uh, Anton, does that? Does that kind of address your question, really? Um, such a great question, an important question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who came. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Anton in the comments says, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and a huge thank you to Sarah and Margo. You'd be seeing us applaud if we were, you know, in person, but we are applauding in our hearts and in our living rooms. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Yeah, we, we look forward to seeing you read in person again someday. Thank yeah. you. Well, Gwen and Leah, it is so generous of you to make this possible. Um, thank you so much tonight and, and Margo, what a thrill to uh, share this space. I don't want to say virtual space. It feels like a real space. I really do feel a sense of presence. And I, I'm, so, I'm so grateful for that. Well, I feel very fortunate to have finally met you after many years of wanting to. And thank you to everyone for reminding us that despite everything, we have a community of writers and readers. and we do remain connected. I mean, the great thing about writing is that we can share it across time and space and we can reach each other. And it's lovely to be reminded of that so tangibly. So thanks to everyone who came this evening for taking part. <laughs>